Okay, I'm ready. Good afternoon. This week we're going to continue with the analysis of a motor car divorce and spend today's lecture mostly analyzing specific passages because this is exactly the kind of work that you will be doing answering the questions in the final exam. The question will ask you to discuss some of the themes in some of the readings, and I'll provide a short list before the end of the month, with the support of some passages that will be included in the packet. The exam's uh, text will be accompanied by a package with uh, pages from the readings that the questions are focusing on. This week's film is a Nice film from 1971 by Jacques Tati. It's called Trafic, and it's almost a silent film with very few lines and a peculiar way to uh, include the audio and the background noises in the film itself. On Thursday, I also want to complete the discussion of the in-class activity on the final project and review with you what the various groups produced and provide suggestions and alternatives. Before we proceed with today's plan, we have a couple of minutes, two or three minutes, left in the conclusion of last Thursday's film, The First Auto. If you remember at this point, and the father believes he has killed his son Bob by sabotaging his race car without knowing he would be the driver, just trying to destroy the technology, right? Following a narrative pattern that uh, has, has been found, can be identified in several narratives that we have presented. However, he also goes back to the stables, destroys the stables, because that is also a part of the past that cannot be retrieved. Right after he walks out of the stables, Rose will come to pick him up with a car and to tell him the good news that Bob is alive at the hospital and wants to see him. And then there is an epilogue showing the time of the film. The film starts in the 1890s at around 1895-96. And the conclusion is the time when the movie was released, so 1926 or 27. I'm using the YouTube video, the quality is not exactly the same, but just to save time by, by not playing the DVD. <laughs> not just forgiveness that was a big theme during that era, but redemption in general. A lot of films were about tales of redemption, where a character comes back from a big sin or a mistake they made in the past. And of course, it's telling, as I suggested, that Hank should go to the hospital with a car, right? That's the first sign of transformation and the sign on the stables becomes the sign on the factory that has been built where the stables used to be and now 
Father and son are working together building automobiles and this is supposed to be their catalog, right? The kind of cars they make, although some of them clearly are simply cars from that era we just saw at Rolls Royce and you can identify the other cars through the Internet Movie Car Database. So the automobile that divided father from son to the point where the father tried to kill the son has now the unifying element. And then we have this epilogue with Hank and a friend going to see a race where cars are going even faster than in any of the previous scenes. And Bob and Rose will just be mentioned, will not be part of the conclusion. So if you remember, the beginning of the film was a race where Han was racing a horse, and now the conclusion is revisiting the same kind of narrative content with cars. And the mayor is there. Just to add some fun, they, they put that line, and the emphasis is on speed. And to make sure that the audience understood that this was an allegory of the transition of American society from the past to the present, they have this last frame with the horse by itself next to the dead tree. Now, of course, whenever a film from this era insists on the theme of family harmony to be achieved through reconciliation, through forgiveness, you would expect at the end of that film to see the family united, to see the family together behaving in a different way, showing the kind of harmony and reconciliation they have achieved. If we don't see that happening here, to me, that only means that the characters playing Bob and Rose were not available at the end of the film. Actors during that time shot a lot of films. They were usually paid not by the film, but by the week or by the month, while being employed by a studio such as Warner Brothers, so maybe by the time they shot the last scene, those actors were already engaged on another set. Okay, any questions, any comments about the film before we move on? Yes, please. I feel like the film also has like also, I feel like the film has a lot of unintended stops. For example, it shows sort of the consequences of social Darwinism during this period. While yes, Hank's pride in his business was what led to his downfall, and um, that was the sole reason why he didn't purchase a car. A lot of people couldn't purchase cars around this time. It was a status symbol as a result. And right. But, I, it, but it's an allegory, right? Yeah. You have to read this not as the story of a group of individuals 
And therefore, instead of trying to recognize the reasons behind their decisions, you have to acknowledge that it's a story that presents the elect represents the transformation of American society, a society rooted in rural culture, in the use of the horse, into a more industrialized and more technologically savvy society, right? I can also see it almost as an allegory, though, as well, of how people, unfortunately, were forced to eat, obviously, and how sometimes that mental, like how societal progress often leaves others behind, whether they choose to be left behind or not. That was the view that was common during that time, mm -hmm. right? You can argue that uh, this, this model this interpretation of social trends doesn't hold much water. However, it is quite often what you find in these narratives that is true also of a motor car divorce, this idea that society evolves in a pseudo-Darwinian way whereby certain social types or profiles become more successful, are imitated by other people, and other social types or profiles become obsolete and perish, not in, meaning that the, those individuals are eliminated, but that those social profiles are not replicated or used as model by as many. So there is this uh, understanding of how Darwin's laws would apply in terms of the fittest models and whenever you talk about Darwin, keep in mind that uh, the, the key uh, uh, idea, the key notion in Darwin's model is the idea that you have an ecosystem that changes, right? So uh, the, the species exist inside an ecosystem that changes and the species change as well to adapt to it or to adapt to each other. So in this case, socially, the idea is that technology is going to change the human and social ecosystem in such a radical way that it will require a radical adaptation by humans who were used to a completely different kind of environment, socially, in their workplace, etc. And therefore, you have this idea that some people are naturally predisposed to adapting to the new technological society, can react more quickly, and others don't show uh, such predisposition and therefore uh, they'll be left behind. That is an idea that will be strongly represented in next week's novel from Pekin to Paris, where one of the characters is Ettore Guizzardi, the son of a locomotive engineer who becomes very proficient in the use of cars and seems to have this very natural, organic connection with cars. And therefore, he represents the future of, of humankind, where you are supposed to see more and more social types that are similar to Ettore Guizzardi, who can understand the machine, but they understand it through a symbiotic relationship. They don't have to uh, study the machine or analyze the parts in the machine. They just feel if the machine is working or not, uh, because they have developed that kind of symbiosis. Let me switch to the notes and uh, on Louise Closer Hill's In Motor Car Divorced, and I'll resume from the selection of excerpts that you find under the notes with the section entitled The Plan, the Plot, the Implied Conclusion, because it reminds you also of the story. In a motor car divorce, John and Peggy, after 10 years of marriage, agreed to separate 
so that she can be seen as a feminist, regaining, reclaiming her independence from her husband like a modern woman is supposed to do. In order to achieve this result, since they need proper justification before they appear in front of a judge, they come up with the idea of purchasing the car he wanted, and it becomes their first vehicle. They will ship it to Naples, go through Italy and France, then come back with another ship uh, crossing the Atlantic back to New York City. And during the trip, she will keep a diary annotating all the episodes where he was in some way or another abusive towards her. And she will produce that diary and list those episodes in front of the judge. And he will not deny, as you find in here, that those things actually happened. So it's a series of twists on the basic plot of a couple during doing uh, Europe, uh, going on a trip uh, to Europe, because they go on a trip with an automobile, which makes them different in 1906. They do it in order to divorce, which is, of course, paradoxical. And as we said about the general story, there will be other twists whereby Peggy will feel that they're indeed about to separate, that John is getting close to another woman. So let's review the summary of the story as it is presented in the first chapter. His idea, John's idea, is to buy a good American machine. John is American to the backbone. The, the car will, actually, will be an actual car, a northern, which is not mentioned directly, but mentioned through a reference to the silent, like the star uh, uh, slogan used to advertise that car. Take it to Naples with us and drive it through Italy and France, clear up to Cherbourg. Cherbourg is on the uh, uh, French shores on the Atlantic, one of the ports from which you can go back to the US. This is the area where the landing in Normandy on June 6, 1944, the day happened, um, or some such port on our return trip home. And she's being vague because they'll never mention this part of the story. They won't even get to Paris, right, before the conclusion. I am to accompany him. So you see here you have a description of the roles of the characters and keep a diary in which I am to register our daily bickerings. And when the time comes, bring it into court as evidence against him, which he will not deny. And of course, you can be sure that everything announced in here will not happen as planned. By the end, we find out that the diary is in fact empty, other than a list of numbers placed there by John, who put there the miles they traveled and the money they spent on gasoline. Right after that, in the first chapter, we find a reference to the effects of the automobile on couples, which makes you think that this plan is destined to fail somehow that uh, they will not be arguing during the trip as much as they would like to or as much as Peggy herself would like to. What is interesting to us in this particular passage is the idea that the use of this technology of the automobile should have an effect on the psyche, on the emotions of a couple. This idea that when you interact with the technology, there are unforeseen effects that you cannot control. Whether you want or not to argue with your companion, for example, the car will change your disposition, right? As if the car becomes 
gets in control Thank of you. the situation. You're welcome. Okay, so she mentions an anecdote uh, that you can read on your own where they go out with another couple and they sit in front, of course, and John and Peg sit in the back and she wants to sound the horn so that everyone can see they're driving by and that they have a car. So first of all, you see how there is this idea that you purchase the car in order to be seen on it so that your public persona, your public identity can be scaffolded, can be supported and expanded by the ownership and the use of that technology. But even more importantly is the fact that after arguing about the excessive use of the horns, because the husband is not too happy about it, when they get out of the car, they're completely in love, right? And it doesn't matter, don't, don't focus on the details, how can a car ride put you in such a good disposition, especially if during the car ride you were arguing whether or not about whether or not you should be uh, sounding the horn driving through neighborhoods. What's important to us is this idea that the car will determine your emotions. This idea that the interaction between the technology and the humans is beyond the traditional modalities of interaction with other technologies, right? You would not expect this to happen after using other kinds of means of transportation, etc. I noticed previously, I noted previously how one of the signs that this is also a novel about consumerism and the culture of consumption is the fact that you find it included at the beginning of the story, the process of purchasing the car, how they choose the car, how they test different cars, and how they come to their choice. In this passage, also, you find the idea that a good car is necessary not only to be seen in it, so you don't want to be seen in a cheap, ugly car, but also because it supports a certain kind of interaction with other people. So essentially the car becomes an extension of the character's identity. These are the plans that they come up with. One was to buy the cheapest machine, another was to buy the most expensive. Imagine the characters in 1906 dealing with the choice of a car, having too many choices, having by this point hundreds of models to choose from, but the automobile is also a kind of, kind of a new product, so they don't know how to choose, how to reduce the options. So these are strategies to reduce the number of options. The cheapest, the most expensive. Of course, the most expensive is too expensive for them. They're mid, upper middle class or uh, upper class, but they're not one percenters, right? They're not millionaires. And the most expensive cars during this period can be fabulously expensive. And the cheapest has such ugly lines. This is the aesthetics part. I don't want to be seen in it, but it's not, it doesn't end there. I could never have gone about in it with any degree of comfort. And then notice how this is developed. Riding in a good looking car is just like wearing good clothes. And this is a concept that you find repeated in other texts, for example, even in Alfredo Testoni's play on the automobile, this idea that the car is part of the individual's elegance. The consciousness of having on or being in something elegant gives one the courage to drive good bargains without losing one's self-respect, and that is a lot in Europe. That is to say, when people will look at them, 
they will not be able to project the kind of identity that makes them more powerful, hence the reference to negotiations without the car. So the car becomes a prop. It becomes the outer shell of an identity they want to build and maintain while going to Europe. But if that is possible in Europe, why not in the United States as well? Madison. Um, I feel like um, today, and probably back in the day, there probably was a uh, correlation between lower prices, lower quality, and by extension, lower safety standards. Is that especially true for this period, considering how things were far more unregulated than they are now, both in terms of the governmental level and in terms of corporations? Well, they weren't looking at safety necessarily, not really. Um, and it is true that during this period, there are some cars that are much more expensive than they should be. They're trying to position themselves into the upper segment of the market just through the price, not through the quality of the car. And um, that happens a lot during the, 19th century, the 20th century, I would say well into the 1960s, especially when you look at cars produced by small factories, what would be now classified as an exotic car, often the prices were not justified other than the fact that they were trying to sell exactly to people with a certain kind of income. Okay, uh, but uh, I don't think you can really compare the situation in the novel to what you find nowadays, especially because this, what you see here, is the reality of purchasing an automobile that is represented through multiple layers of irony. As I said last week, you have the author who was by this time a great and a celebrated successful professional actress who frequents people in the upper middle classes and the upper classes by virtue of her profession, right? Even the wealthiest want to invite successful actors. So she frequents social groups, social circles, where people are making more money than she as an actress or her husband Walter are making. And she observes people around her. And what she brings to the novel is the ironic portrayal of social types she must have seen in New York City. Especially in the case of Peggy, the uh, slim, beautiful, nicely, elegantly dressed young woman who is not really mature or not as much as she believes she is, not as socially savvy uh, as she pretends to be, and desperately trying to be seen as accomplished and successful either, by, either through the accessories she surrounds herself with, her clothes, or even the automobile, the experience of a trip to Europe, or by mimicking behaviors that she sees as associated with rewards or with compliments, such as, I want to show other women that I can be a pioneer in the field of feminism by divorcing my husband, but she's not really there. She's pretending to be there, but she's not, she has not grown up to the time of that decision. She makes the decision before turning into any kind of independent woman. So in general, we can say that you find at work in this kind of novel, the same general trope or theme that you find in plenty of commercials from today's cars 
to other products, the expectation for the consumer that if they buy the product, if they purchase the product, their lifestyle will change. And they will be, for one thing, they will be seen as different by others, as unique. And the second aspect is that they will expand their lives and they'll be able to have experiences afforded by the product they've purchased that would not have been within their range had they not purchased the product. So this, in one way or another, is expressed even in marketing campaigns of today, right? And it was especially visible during the 20th century up until the 1960s and 70s. Right? In marketing campaigns, especially for cigarettes and for automobiles, right? Where the imagery would have included clues to the fact that once you smoke this kind of cigarette or once you have this kind of automobile, you'll be at the center of attention. People will be looking at you differently. People will be looking up at you and will think highly of you and therefore you will enjoy a kind of social success you would not have had otherwise because before no one was looking at you because you were not smoking or uh, smoking cheap cigarettes or not driving a certain kind of automobiles. And you find the same, of course, in films, especially of that era, right? Where the automobile can be this instrument, this turning point in the life of a character, taking the character uh, through a transformation or in a place where people are looking at the character as someone more successful. But I'd be careful not to take everything you read here literally, right? Because it is still the view of this technology by someone who acknowledges with closer hail, how exaggerated the importance of this technology is in her society or in her segment of society, right? So she, she's constantly making fun of the characters and their interest in the automobile for all the wrong reasons, to show off, to be seen in it, to be perceived as worthy of respect, right? So this is a process of aggrandizing oneself through the purchase of a product. And what's interesting is that eventually the plan they resort to in order to pick the automobile among the hundreds of choices they have available around themselves is pretty much a supernatural process. In order to understand this, you have to go back to the Christian tradition and to St. Augustine in particular. Let's read this and then I'll explain the reference to St. Augustine. I took the book away from him, prayed for a sign, shut my eyes, turned to pages, described a circle with my finger, the book, of course, is some kind of catalog, right? There were publications with uh, different models produced in a given year. And that kind of publication continued well into the 1990s. Describe the circle with my finger, put it down on the page, open my eyes, and silent as the stars blinked into my face, silent as a star being the slogan for this American card called the Northern, and so they interpret this to be the sign they were waiting for that they should buy this car. As I said before, this is the parody of a tradition, of a long-standing tradition in Christian circle that initiated with St. Augustine, who in his memoirs tells the readers how uh, during a difficult part of his life at the end of his youth, before his conversion, 
taken by many different thoughts, he went into the garden of his house in uh, northern Africa. St. Augustine was a Roman citizen from what is today Algeria. So he's inside this walled garden, shielded from the outside, thinking, and he has with him the Bible or the Gospels, and he hears a voice from the other side of the wall, which could also be a supernatural voice that says, tolle lege, which is Latin for pick and read. And so he opens the book and picks a passage without looking at it with his finger. He reads those verses from the Bible and finds how those verses apply to him. That is to say, this supernatural process becomes, in St. Augustine's memoir, one way that God is giving him the recipe to come out of his current situation, and that is, marks the beginning of his conversion, and then he'll become a priest eventually, he'll become a bishop, he'll go to Milan, go back to what is a uh, Carthage in what is today uh, Tunisia, etc. So it's quite telling that even the car becomes worthy of this alignment with supernatural and spiritual practices. It tells you in an ironic way the kind of importance that the characters are assigning to this uh, to this car. And then the scene continues with more anticipation, right? Which is a phase we found in the patterns, in the narrative patterns for the use of the automobile, where the night before they actually get the automobile, Peg cannot sleep because she feels her life is about to change in many different ways. And the next morning, John comes by with the car and to include a reminder that Peggy is playing the part of a feminist, but she's not much of a feminist, you have this other small episode where the person from the dealership who has accompanied John home, because if you remember, when you purchase a car during this period, someone has to come to your house to show you how to use it, uses the phrase, it's so simple a woman can run it, and Peggy will recognize that this is sexist, right? And that she should react to this, but because it's really an insult to my sex. However, keep in mind that is what you find also in here is the writer making fun of Peggy for not really being a true feminist. Right, but just pretending to be one. And in fact, at this point, uh, she's so much the opposite of a feminist that she has, at this point, agreed, uh, uh, submitted to her husband's request not to go to the Minerva Club anymore, not to tell anyone about their plans. And in fact, she is staying, spending a lot of time at home. And at the end of this segment, she will in fact say, I feel like a 30 horsepower silent as the stars shut up in a whole bedroom. Meaning, I have all this pent up energy, I have all these plans, but I'm forced to stay home waiting for the trip to begin. And of course, it's also relevant that she would compare herself already with this automobile she didn't want and that she will end up driving successfully by the end of the novel. 30 horsepower, 40 horsepower, these were the categories for cars during this period. 20 HP, 30 HP, 40 HP were ways to categorize and classify cars by power and, in fact, 
not only this happened in the US but in Italy as well and you find a reference to it in the sonnets by Alfredo Testoni. Now Peg and John are on the ship and there they meet some of the other characters in the book. For example, Douglas Warwick, the artist. And as I said, the way different characters are associated with different social types reflects the Darwinian view of society. So both Douglas and Peg are on the obsolete side, are dangerously in a position of becoming, of turning obsolete. Peg, because she's not interested in the technology. Douglas, because he has no sense of what is pragmatic in life, no sense of practical needs whatsoever. He is such an absent-minded artist that he needs to have people catering to his own practical needs. And that's the sense of this passage, right? He is perfectly clean. Of course, he has to be elegant. He's part of the, somewhat elegant, he's part of the upper classes, but his clothes do not worry him, meaning he won't change his clothes or wear wrinkled clothes nor do any of the externals of life, not even food. At some meals he eats, and at some meals he talks, but never does both at the same time, and everybody looks after him. I don't know why, just as John looks after him, and you see this parallel being drawn between <coughs> Peg and Douglas, both not being seen as individuals that can be strong and independent in life because of their attitudes and their behaviors. The other characters that will be introduced in this passage are the widow, Mrs. Baring, and her companion, Miss Gray, who are supposed to, they themselves, take a car, but in their case it's a Swiss car by the name of Martini, uh, an automotive company that existed until the 1920s <coughs> and travel through Italy on that car and they will meet Douglas at different points and then Douglas will accompany them either Mrs. Baring or John and Peggy uh, pretty much most of the time. What's interesting about Mrs. Baring is the fact that she is very proficient with cars and as such, she seems to be, she appears to be the perfect companion for someone like John, for different reasons. This is Peggy's portrait of Mrs. Berry. She is tremendously interesting to John on account of her motoring, of course, though she's very good looking too. And there you can see the two elements of danger for Peg who's planning a divorce without really looking for a divorce, planning a divorce without having first separated from her husband. She is large, finely built, and very glistening, shiny hair, I mean, and wall strapped skin and white teeth that flush when she smiles, not tigerishly, but in a friendly way, and just as much at me as at John. Keep in mind that Mrs. Baring's body and physique are the exact opposite of Peg. Peg is thin, and when you find here that Mrs. Baring is large and finely built, those are actually positive qualities in the medical and social view of the time. In within the ideology that we mentioned in reference to Testoni called the social hygiene culture, the culture of social hygiene is predicated upon strongly uh, built women who would be the best specimens to carry on the generation of humankind. 
whereas the thinner, more elegant peg character of peg is not socially fit, seen as socially fit for reproduction. So here you see how the story is telling you that Peg is in danger of losing John and this comment emphasizes the same because in here you see that John is proud of Mrs. Baring as an American woman who can start her own engine. So she is independent technologically vis-a-vis -vis the technology of the automobile and she's also physically strong right she has all the qualities that peggy doesn't have so john and peg go to naples naples is the first stop in their trip to italy but keep in mind that their trip is also seen as the result of consumption of their power to purchase the experience of the trip to Italy. That is to say, everything they live during their trip is not the result of their normal spontaneous interaction with places and people. Everything instead is being seen as if they were inside a postcard. That is to say, everything is picturesque, everything they see, everything they witness is so perfect that this is just something they can add to their public persona, not something that changes them from within, that they live uh, inside. It's something that is added to their lives from the exterior, right? Look at the description of the sunset in Naples. The sun had dropped heavily into the water and lights were popping along the streets, twisted in and about below the shadows of the lamppost, making a black and white plate of the well-swept roads. And then you have the Vesuvius showing his fireworks. The Vesuvius is an active well, a dormant volcano with, with periods uh, of various period, regular periods of activity. For example, right now the Vesuvius is not active, but the area of Naples near Portici, where the Latin city of Herculaneum that was destroyed in 79 BC was located, that area is, has been showing a lot of volcanic activity for the past few months. Okay, so everything is perfect around them but the focus is entirely about their exterior life right which is the confirmation of the process that i was saying that was uh, describing before you buy something in this case you purchase a trip you have the money to go on a trip and that changes the context where you operate and therefore by extension you are seen in a different light. But nothing has happened inside of you, right? And there is no evidence that they're actually moved, that they're changing because of this trip. They're using this trip the same way you would put on a new jacket or buy a new car. Of course, the Neapolitans in this scene are singing. Singing for their supper means there are Neapolitans in the streets that are singing, asking for money so that they can pay for food. And other Neapolitans are going about their lives. And Peggy herself, she sees herself as the perfect actress for this scene. She touches the theatrical nature of this perfect con. Uh, continuing on the emphasis on the picturesque, they get to know uh, a man who takes them on his carriage from the port of Capri to the village of Capri and the various areas on the island, uh, man by, an Italian man by the name of Francesco, who then 
murdered as a result of jealousy, right? Because Italians are so brutal, so ancestral that they will kill someone just for talking to a man, to a woman who is not her wife. After Naples, that is where the automobile gets a more important role in the story, right? Because after spending uh, days in Naples and going from Naples to Capri without using the car, they will leave Naples and go towards Rome and Central Italy and travel through Central Italy. And this is where you can find passages such as this one about elaborating on the effects of the car. Automobile elation is just another version of what we saw in a smaller scale in the episode of the couple arguing about the excessive sound of the horn and then getting out of the car and being more in love than they were before, the idea that the technology will influence your mindset, your psyche, your emotions. Whenever we were in motion, we would become deliriously happy, immediately forget past difficulties and the possibility of future ones and just love everybody. So that's the, support, the alleged effect of a quick ride on the automobile. John says this is called automobile elation. Don't, re, don't forget that John is the expert when it comes to automobiles. All motorists have the sensation. And from this point of view, the novel itself becomes a piece of tech evangelism. That is to say, imagine the readers who, for the, for the most part, in 1906, are reading this and don't own an automobile and have had limited experience with automobiles reading about this and therefore having this expectation of the thrill for an automobile ride. It is hurled into them along with a swift current of air and in the medical texts of the time, this idea that the more air you're exposed to, the better you feel, the healthier you'll become, was really entrenched to the point that around this time you have a pamphlet by a French doctor who claims he can cure, among other things, tuberculosis by having the patients, the people sick with it, recover through automobile rides that expose their suffering lungs to a lot of good air. It's a funny thing, keeps me snappy in the daytime and heavy with sleep at night. So the automobile has brought peace and balance, serenity in Peg's anxious mind. The other side of this psychological change is the automobile phase. The automobile phase is different from the automobile elation because the automobile elation is something you cannot escape. You go on a car and allegedly this happens to you. You have no control over it. The automobile phase is a controlled kind of appearance or look. It's the look that John and other motorists will have trying to mask their disappointment with the technology, trying to pretend that everything is fine when in fact the automobile is breaking down constantly. And when this happens to them, initially with their automobile, they're going on this rural road in Italy, passing farmers on foot, passing farmers on their carriages, and they're all proud and happy and feel powerful because they're going faster than anyone. Then the car breaks down, everyone else on the road catches up with them and sees the rich Americans on the broken down car, and now it's the peasant's turn to be happy of the misfortune of John and Peggy. In this kind of very picturesque Italian trip, the expectation from an American reader is that in a place such as Italy, such a backward place allegedly, you will find, even in 1906, street thieves, rope thieves stopping you on a road and 
with, with weapons and, and robbing you. Uh, these were, in fact, present in Italy during the 19th, 19th century, up until the 1880s or early 1890s, by 1906, you would hardly have found any. But the, the encounter of John and Peg with this road thief called a brigand, which is much more like a fairy tale character, becomes another opportunity for the narrator, Louise, to make fun of the automobile. Because when they are faced with the brigand who would like to rob them, see a bandit with a gun and an umbrella came along, we immediately offer him the car if he would but give us our lives. Meaning, take everything, leave us alone. In fact, take the car, help us get rid of the car. So this becomes an opportunity to make fun of this technology and its unreliability, this lack of reliability. So much so that the bandit will say, no, no, I, I couldn't operate effectively with a car. So I, I want everything, but I don't want the car. And then he takes pity on them and have the, has them uh, uh, taken to his house and to a farm nearby where they can find help. At this farm, there is an interesting encounter between a girl who lives at the farm, so pe a poor peasant girl, and this rich American woman, Peggy. And what's interesting about this is that Peggy is being treated exactly in a different way because of the things she wears. So her identity in here is being evaluated entirely on the basis of her accessories. No queen could have been more gently handled. Why is Peggy being treated like a queen? Because simply she's dressed like one. My hat was removed and admired. Notice how the interaction, which cannot be happening through language because there is a language barrier between the peasant girl, the Italian girl, and Peggy, neither knows the language of the other, goes through the removal and the examination of everything that Peg has on her. My coat shaken out and adored. With careful hands, I was fingered from neck chain and rings to the ruffle of my petticoat, a petticoat of silk. She fell on her knees, giving little cries of rapture, but she's on her knees in front of the elegance of these clothes and rustle the silk between her fingers. How every woman loves that sound. And this goes on for longer through the other accessories, including her jewelry. And at the end of this episode, Peggy will give uh, her petticoat of, made of silk to the peasant woman, even though this peasant woman has no right to wear such an expensive item, which is the same kind of classes consideration we found in a, the lightning conductor where James, when James wears clothes that he claims were given to him as a loan, but feels out of place nonetheless. In Italy, John and Peggy can play games on the road, pretending to be different from what they are. For example, they go to a trattoria and they show a picture of a place in the US. It's a church with a tower. And they say, this is our little country hall, because no one in Italy would be able to say differently to understand that this cannot be. <laughs> and of the various descriptions of their issues with the car, this one is worth noting because it gives the car a humanized behavior, right? It's a good description of a symbiotic interaction with the car where 
the users of the car are trying to humanize the vehicle in order to understand it better. So they're having problems, right? They're struggling to reach this town called Terracina. And they say, they explain it in these terms. Our motor car had different plans, right? So the car becomes, in, inside this passage, a character with its own mind. We were the whole blessed day teasing it as far as that place. We got very well acquainted with the machine, and now and then could grasp a few motor words between its pantings and gurglings. Twice, I'm sure, it said, the machine, the car. What's your hurry? And once John caught it muttering, muttering something about, treat me right, and I'll treat you right, Tell us what you want, said John persuasively. Do you want more gasoline? No answer. Don't you like that nice new oil in the cylinders? Not a sound. John himself was sure it was a leaky valve. It seems they should be ground, etc., etc., okay, but could get no satisfaction from the auto itself. It was as mute as an oyster on the subject, though once, while throwing out some very black smoke, I thought it wheezed tauntingly, why don't you find out? And of course, they constantly have issues with the car. However, the car is still treated like a novelty that attracts the attention of people from different groups in society. And this is a very good example where you find the catalog of different reactions to the car. And again, we're talking about 1906, so it's understandable how in the Italian countryside you would have found people with very limited or no exposure to an automobile. Right? First, they have dismissive thoughts about the train, John and Peg, right? A train typifies only the means to an end, means, meaning the train is a means of transportation. There is no magic associated with a train. And go back to what I said in the core concepts introduction about the difference between transportation technologies, the ship, the train that required an infrastructure where the individual is just a passenger and the machine of the automobile as an individual technology that connects directly with the individual. In a motor, while, we're, while we are great people to the peasants, we are among them. Of course, this is not really true, right? This is irony. They feel superior. But look at the description of the reaction where you find the men and the women, the little boys, the old women, the old men. So it's an intentional catalog of the universal positive reaction. And what is the positive reaction? The automobile generates attention. The men and the women of the fields run pell-mell, quickly, chaotically, to the edge of the sound, to the edge at the sound, of the of our horn and wave a greeting. The little boys of the village meet us at one gate and patter after us after we pass through the other. Old women nod from their looms. <coughs> An old man rings in their ears and hats in hand ask with the simplicity of their race the price of such belly automobile. I wonder how we can give them enough to admire in our poor selves and equipment as fair exchange for what they give us, meaning they make us feel important. Don't forget that this is overall a picturesque representation of Italy. In fact, there is no evidence that old men in central Italy wore rings in their ear had earrings during that time. It is part of this picturesque representation of Italians as if Italians were like uh, gypsies, to use the language of the time. Okay? 
and I just want to skip through the rest and get to the conclusion and review the conclusion with you. So at the end of this trip, after many adventures and misunderstandings, John and Peg are in France. They have a confrontation. Peg is sure that John intended to leave her in order to, and, and actually proceed with the divorce. He agreed to at the beginning of the novel just to make Peg happy. She's sure that now John himself wants a divorce so that he can marry Mrs. Baring. Nothing farther from the truth, and by the end of the novel, Mrs. Baring will marry Douglas Warwick. During this argument they have in France, they've stepped out of the automobile on a rural road. They're surrounded by trees that are rocks. So John falls down and hits a rock. A boulder had turned under him and he had gone back helpless and crashed on to the stones. There he lay still white, staring up at me with sightless eyes. So John has lost consciousness possibly seriously injured, and what is the only solution that Peck can come up with? What is that can save her life and her romantic relationship as well? The automobile, of course. The automobile still has the engine on by the side of the road, and she decides to leave John where he is because she's afraid that by moving him, she could cause further trauma, but she thinks she has to uh, go and find a doctor. The silent pounding of the engine came like an answer to my cry for help. How could I, how could I drive? Keep in mind that up to this point, Peg has been helping John with the car but has never driven by herself, unlike the character of Molly in The Lightning Conductor. John had always been with me when I had driven it. How could I guide that car to Fontainebleau? I looked at John again. His face seemed to be taking on a more deathly pallor. So there is impending tragedy and she has to act. She takes the car and tries to remember how to drive. Now I'll go to the high speed, right? Remember cars from this period often had only three or four gears for the cars with three gears would have been low speed, high speed and reverse. It doesn't set in. Oh dear, what is the matter? Hold on now, Peggy, don't get panicky. There, <coughs> it's going faster. But what does it need to give it power? Why? Fuel, of course. That must be gas, and that's the throttle. So she tried to remember how to operate all the various levers in the car. I must open the throttle. Now it's bounding. But the road is bad. John would never have gone this way over rut this fast, meaning, right? Yes, John would for me, I will for John. Oh, please God, let me do this for John. And the rest of the narrative here, it's a combination of her sense of impending tragedy, how she could lose John, not just as a partner, but John might die entirely. And also how in spite of this tragedy, which morally and socially compels her to feel negative emotions, sadness and such, in spite of this, she feels the automobile elation that we found in the previous passage. That is to say, this automobile ride is really exhilarating to her. Even in this kind of situation, she cannot control the emotions that are being produced by the car and by the car ride at this high speed. Okay, so it's a very interesting conclusion and, and probably the best part of the novel. Let me 
find just a couple of passages. Let me also circulate the pendants while I bring this to a conclusion to show you the contradictory feelings, right? So a lot of details about the operation of the car. So John is not there with her. She's saving him. He's dying. But while she's thinking of John, she also has to focus on the uh, on, on the car in order to operate the car, right? All the while hoping that she will be able to, to save him. What must I do? I know. It's just the same with sleds when one's a little girl, fly down without the brake so as to gather strength to go up the next hill just as fast. Here we go now, how the air cuts my face. That was a gendarme way back there. She also has to escape the police that is trying to stop her because she's going too fast. But she cannot stop until she has found a hospital or a doctor. And they're telling her, fast, too fast. Um, so, what is that sound inside of me? I'm laughing. Of all the times to laugh, there is no joke about John's dying. Dying? It's not dying. I'm saving him. And from this point on, you have these contradictory feelings. I'm supposed to feel sad for John, but I cannot ignore what I'm feeling as a result of my driving the automobile. Stop, no, I won't stop. Meaning, the police is trying to stop me, but I will not. In the first place, I don't know how. There, I laughed again. How horrible. So she feels bad. She knows that people would judge her to be a horrible person if they knew that she's laughing while trying to speed the car to save her husband. But she cannot avoid that. Okay, and then of course, by the end, John will be taken to the hospital. There is the uh, final uh, reconciliation between John and Peg. John will uh, explain the misunderstandings that every reader can catch throughout the novel. That is to say, it is just Peggy who believes that John is about to leave her with, to go with Mrs. Baring, and they learn that Mrs. Baring is going to marry uh, Douglas. And uh, by the end of the novel, the transformation has happened. So what was the significance of this contrived idea of getting a divorce? Well, it was simply a literary device to show that by the end of the book, by the end of the story, Peg and John are together because Peg has chosen John. Whereas when they got married, she was so young and naive and really didn't understand much about love and relationship. Now, having gone through all the various twists and incidents of the story, her decision to stay with John is a more mature decision. However, because this is also kind of a comedy, anyone can see that she's as connected to John as she is to their automobile. So they're a more mature couple, staying together for the right reasons, not just because they got married when they were younger, but also a modern couple because there is the technology of the automobile creating additional an additional connection between them through their common interest and their common attraction to the technology of the automobile. Okay, so keep in mind on Thursday, I will go back to the project and talk more about the template for the selection of the short stories. The last written assignment will be due Friday of next week on November 10th. Okay, it has to do with the project, and we'll talk about that. And on Thursday, we'll also see at least some scenes from a new film, Traffic, from 1971.